Who, who has the button back here? <laughs> that was a random story. Yeah, I, I've got. I do like We had we had one guy get in serious trouble though. A teacher. He went to. It was a big kid, you know. And there was a confrontation. He went to push the kid here. The kid ducked. He hit him in the jaw and broke his jaw. Oh, he was him. Yeah, he wasn't hitting him. It wasn't like a closed foot. Just he went to push the the guy and he yeah and he ducked and he hit him in the jaw. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, he wasn't a lightweight either. You know the the faculty guy. But yeah, it was it was pretty bad. All right. Enough of uh, junior high and high school stories. <laughs> <clears throat> right, yeah, yeah, that that all had a purpose. <laughs> uh, well, here's our final week, and this is, if if you like thinking about weird stuff in the Bible, this is the, you thought the other stuff was weird, it's going to get sort of amped up here a little bit. But we're going to talk about <clears throat> sacred space a little bit again, and the concept of God being in control of chaos, which is another way of saying control of creation, but really even more broadly than that, being in control of everything, and how in Israelite thinking, those two things get married in the temple in certain ways. And then we'll hit a certain point where because of the, they thought that way about the temple, that essentially the temple was the center of, of the cosmos. There are certain things said in relation to the temple and the throne of God, which of course is in the temple, that impacted you know, certain people uh, between the Testaments to think certain ways about the sacred calendar, the festival calendar of the Torah, and prophecy. So there, it's, it's going to be some weird stuff, but it's really, it's really kind of fascinating because there are elements of it that kind of play into the New Testament and some other things that are more familiar to us. But this is sort of a, a free-for-all tonight, but it's just some kind of interesting stuff. Now, I had this slide up before when we talked about sacred space and about to, to sort of wrap your head around the way they looked at their Bible. In a number of places, you have to be thinking mythically. And again, that doesn't mean, oh, it's all just a fairy tale. What it means is that there's, there's a very real supernatural element, not only to episodes in scripture, but basically everything. All of life is sort of permeated by supernatural activity and meaning. So thinking, you know, mythically is really important because when writers and their readers are thinking this way, what they say will often transcend sort of a simple literal reading because they want to communicate certain ideas through metaphor and symbol. They want to drop certain vocabulary, not so that your mind parses that word like you would do it if you looked, up, looked it up in a dictionary, but that all the baggage that comes with that word just floods into your mind. The illustration I like to use uh, for our own time period would be something like Las Vegas, okay? You know, you, we, we can, oh, that's a city in Nevada. Well, great, yeah, it is, but there's all sorts of ideas <laughs> that accrue <laughs> to the term Las Vegas. That's, that's, again, just, like what? no, we're not going to get into that. <laughs> yeah. But that, again, that, th there, are, there are terms, you know, there are places, there are people, there are institutions, even events in, in Scripture that when you brought them into a narrative, you did so not just so that somebody could sort of, oh, yeah, I can, I could, it takes like two hours to get there, you know, like, like this literalistic feel but you would be thinking about the place's history and all the stuff associated with it. Again, that, that has you know, some real impact, again, on thinking mythically. So we, we use that to talk about sacred space, which we, our short definition was where God is or has appeared, and how that was set off from normal space. A couple of new elements here. Where God is, 
by definition, is where there is peace, order, justice, which again, the Hebrew term for that is shalom. Really all of that is shalom. Stated negatively, it's the absence of disorder, the absence of injustice, the absence of anything that's, that's chaotic. And by chaotic, I mean not just that things are messy and need arranging. It's the, the, the theological concept of chaos has to do with a state of existence that is contrary to the way God wants it. Okay, God wants order. He wants peace. He wants uh, life to, to run as he designed it to run. When it's not, that's a chaotic situation. So every place that lacks the above, uh, again, these are the bad things, uh, it needs to be made fit for sacred space or everything, everything that has you know, the, the, the problems needs to be made fit for sacred space. Again, a more sort of official definition. Chaos describes the state of disorder that would exist in the absence of divinely imposed order on the cosmos. In biblical and ancient Near Eastern literature, the supreme gods or the God of Israel brought order to the universe and subdued the forces of chaos. Somebody bigger than people has to bring, bring order to creation. That's a little bit above our pay grade, our job description. And so people in the ancient world would assume that, well, that's the gods, that's what they do. That's what they're supposed to do. If you were an Egyptian, you would sort of transfer that idea to Pharaoh. Well, Pharaoh's the God around here. So, you know, if, if, if something isn't working, it's his fault. You know, there's just this, you know, if the Nile doesn't flood and our crops just, you know, we get half the yield and then people start starving, that's his fault. Mm -hmm. Kind of like the president. <laughs> Everything is his fault. And again, you know, the, it, it was, it was a, it took on a, not just, a, the, 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 even though they did this, when, when that situation arose in Egypt, that was time for Pharaoh's enemies to, to propose ideas like, well, he's really not who the gods put here. He needs to be run out of town. And I had a dream the other night and it's me. You know, I mean, it's, you know, somebody would, would become a rival. They would use it, you know, as a, as a political wedge, but it was, it was bigger than that. It was scary. This is why the plagues were really a big deal, because they upset the natural order of things. And specifically, Pharaoh couldn't do anything about it except make it worse. You know, when he brought the magicians in, they did, you know, imitate it. Well, that, that really helps. Now it's like it was bad. Now you made it worse. You know, why can't you do anything here? It was a real assault on their whole worldview. Uh, back to the quote here, the chaotic unpredictability and latent threat of the sea often was a factor in this. We mentioned the sea before because it's wild, it's untamable, you can't live there. You know, it, it, it's just, it's not where people belong. The, the sea often became a metaphor for unpredictable, chaotic, dangerous, life-threatening stuff. It's another reason why when, when you have a, a situation like the sea is parted, okay, that shows who is in control of that. It's not just a, a miracle in the physical world sense. It's, it, it, it's, it's the claim of supremacy, um, you know, in relation to every other God. Because there's only one who, and not only that, but the, the one who's claiming to be in control, well, their, their troops go in there and they wind up dead, you know. It, it's this sort of thing. And so this, this, it's an event that gets referenced in a number of ways, and the whole idea of taming the sea. We, we could go through, I'll go through a couple of them here in the Old Testament. But you go through five, six, seven, eight, nine of these in the Old Testament. And then when Jesus walks on the water, when he says, peace, be still, it takes on a whole different flavor. As there's only, only a few times we've ever seen anything like that. And it was, it was, you know, Yahweh of Israel. So like, what's going on here? Again, it, it meant something to them on a real, you know, sort of cosmic level. Now you have literature in the ancient world, the Baal cycle I mentioned here at the bottom is an important one because Baal is the chief rival to the God of Israel. And in this Baal cycle, it's just a collection of tablets. His main conflict is the battle against the God of the sea, Yom. Yom in Canaanite is the same as Hebrew, Yom. It's the same word because their languages are related. 
Baal's eventual victory symbolizes the triumph of order over chaos. In addition to the sea itself, chaos could be represented as a sea serpent or a great sea beast or dragon that lives in the sea. Why would they do that? You know, is that like a, is that like an anatomy lesson? Is this like, you know, real re reporting on some real animal? Well, maybe some of them thought that there was really a dragon that, you know, whose tail and his mouth, you know, encircled the entire world. And maybe somebody thought that. But it became a symbol of the badness, the dangerousness of this place. So when you came across things like a sea and the dragon, these terms show up in the Bible. They show up also in the Baal cycle. Leviathan, Rahab, and we're not talking about the woman, okay, with, with Joshua. Okay? It's not a slam on her. And not the deep. These terms wind up in the Hebrew Bible. And in some places, they actually quote some of these stories, like the Baal cycle. This is Psalm 74. These lines, basically line 13 down through 15, come right out of the Baal cycle. Okay, why are they doing that? And the, the Canaanites thought that Baal did all this stuff. Baal's the one who subdued the sea monster. He brings order to the sea, to the creation, crush the heads of Leviathan, all this stuff. And the psalmist says, no, no, it, it's not Baal, it's the God of Israel. You read, you know, First line in 12, it, God is my king from of old. You read a few lines up, a few lines later, it's going to be Yahweh of Israel. They would do things like this to be a theology lesson. It's not Baal who's in control of this stuff. It's Yahweh of Israel. They would do it to all different kinds of deities. It's basically a slap in the face to competing theologies. Biblical writers did this a lot. In this case, again, you have the reference you look at the rest of the language here, I don't think I have a, a uh, laser here. But look at the language down here. You've established the heavenly lights in the sun. The day is yours than the night. You fix the boundaries of the earth. What does that sound like? Sounds like creation language. Sounds like something right out of Genesis. Well, what happens in Genesis? You know, we'll wait till we get there. In Genesis, we have the waters are calm, the waters are the deep, the Spirit of God is hovering over the waters. Okay, that's the way that creation is described here. It's violent. Okay, God has to act to bring that into order. And it's done through metaphor. In Genesis, it's just, you know, still and waiting for God to, to get to work on it. Psalm 89, you have another one. You rule the raging sea, O Lord. You crushed Rahab like a carcass. Rahab is another one of these beast names that you get in the ancient world. The heavens are yours, the earth is yours also. The world, all that is in it. You have founded them. Creation for an Israelite was not just the story of, well, you know, we don't really understand this, but 2,000 years later, there's going to be this guy named Darwin that this is going to really kick in the butt. Okay, that, that isn't the point. That's the way we think of creation stories, because we have a problem, like, like, like an evolutionary worldview or something like that. We'll take the accounts and start thinking about the things that our culture forces us to think about. What they were thinking about is we need someone bigger than us to make us a habitable world and to make it livable. It has to be orderly or else we're going to die. We're at the mercy of nature. Somebody has to control that and keep it under control. And that was how they thought about creation, which is why they put, they set the bringing about of creation in weird language, like slaying a sea monster. Like that just sounds so odd to our ear. Psalm 74, why would you associate creation with killing Leviathan? I didn't read that in Genesis. No, you didn't. It's just sort of already happened in Genesis. Psalm 89, crushing Rahab like a carcass. And the earth is yours, the heaven is yours. You have founded them. Well, yeah, no kidding. But wh why describe it this way? The reason they described it this way is they're trying to teach the idea of where God is, there is order. God is the one in control of all order. He's the one that keeps us from being exterminated by creation, essentially. Now, all of that 
you know, we're, we're, we're leading up to something here. Uh, you get the same language here. You get the dragon, Rahab. Was it not you who cut Rahab in pieces, who pierced the dragon? Was it not you who dried up the sea, Yom, the waters of the great deep, to home? That's, that's Genesis language. Who made the depths of the sea a way for the redeemed to pass over? Again, God in control of the chaotic forces that would try to exterminate Israel. And all this language is deliberate. Here's our Genesis reference. In the beginning, very familiar, darkness was over the face of the deep, to home, Spirit of God hovering over the faces of the waters, face of the waters. And God saw at the end, everything was very good. There was evening and morning, and that was the sixth day. Okay, very good, tov ma'od, is not the word for perfect in Hebrew. That's tamim. This is an entry from a Hebrew lexicon. Uh, how out of you care to look it up. But the point is, is that when you get to the Eden story, Eden, like I said two weeks ago, Eden was a place that had specific geography. It wasn't the whole world. It was the place where God was. It was the model for what life could be. Everywhere else was uncertain. All that other stuff, it was, it was very good. God had you know, brought you know, the, the forces of chaos sort of under restraint, under control. But man, it could just, it could just erupt at any point. We could have you know, storms. We could have earthquakes. You know, we could have all these natural forces kill us off. And so when God go, you know, goes and creates Eden, puts you know, Adam and Eve in the garden, he commissions them to subdue the earth and fill it, okay? Yes, they're supposed to work in the garden and maintain that, but they're supposed to multiply and go out and bring the rest of the world into a state like this, like Eden. That was their job. So that, you know, God's presence, his control, his rule would spread over the earth among people and everywhere that they were at. That's the vision. That's the original vision for humanity, for human life in God's world. A trusting that God, as you obey him, that he will bless you and bring order to your world. It's a very simple set of ideas. Now, the fall, of course, brings an end to that. There's an eruption of chaos. Eden is no more, which is why sacred space from that point forward has to sort of get a toehold somewhere. God doesn't give up on the plan. He doesn't annihilate humanity. He doesn't eliminate everything and just say that was a terrible idea. Of course, God really can't do that if he's omniscient. <laughs> okay. God anticipates these things. You know, we, we know this about the plan of redemption, the whole bit. <clears throat> but from that point on, it's God trying to maintain his promise, his plan, to work with humans to sort of start the ball rolling again. And it happens in, in different stories, God trying to do this. He enters into covenants with people. He First of all, he creates Israel out of nothing. You know, first, it's trying to work with humanity as a whole. That you know, works until you get to Babel. After Babel, you have God saying, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call this one guy, Abraham, I'm gonna start my own people through him. That's why in the story there are direct parallels between Abraham's life and Adam's life, between the history of Israel and the history of Adam. You're supposed to think about both of them at the same time. God's trying to do the same thing again. That's why you have the tabernacle. Looks like Eden. That's why the temple all reminds me of Eden. You know, we talked about this two weeks ago. <clears throat> that all of this is deliberate planning, deliberate messaging. And tonight... You know, I want to sort of focus on how they thought about sort of the, it's not the final installment, but for an Israelite, what they thought was the final installment of God re returning to earth, restoring his presence, and then everything would sort of mushroom out, would blossom out in theory, and the Lord would return to earth and rule the earth. And that was Jerusalem. That was Mount Zion. This is where... This was now the sacred mountain. It wasn't Sinai anymore. 
It's not Eden. Eden, of course, is also called a mountain in Ezekiel 28, not just a garden. It's none of these other places where God appeared, did things, said things. We are finally in the land that God chose, that God promised for the people that he chose and created. We're finally in there. We finally have a king, okay, the man after God's own heart. You know, Again, this, this template kind of guy. And we have a temple. So everything's supposed to be wonderful now. <laughs> and we know the rest of the story and how it turned out. But the way they thought about the temple, even here you have Ezekiel 38. E Ezekiel, of course, is writing when the temple's about to be destroyed. And he's telling them why this is going to happen. But the way they thought about this place, about Zion and the temple, is where I want to camp sort of the rest of the night. Because it's, again, it, it's interesting. It's kind of bizarre. Uh, very foreign to us, which I think is why it's interesting, because it's we just don't think the, on these terms. But as far as Jerusalem, in Ezekiel 38, 12, Jerusalem is described as the center of the earth. Now, you know, like if you did your surveying measurements and all this stuff, is that really literally how it's going to work out? No. Well, that, there's an error, you know, the biblical writer must have flung geography or math or something. So, like, look, the center of the earth, again, it has nothing to do with literal math and geography. The whole point is that it's the center of God's activity. It's the place from which he is now going to fulfill his original plan, you know, fulfill his covenants, all these things. It's it's the headquarters, it's the beachhead, it's the nerve center, you know, think of it that way, and you'll get the point. Of course, the center of Jerusalem was the temple. That was where everything focused on. It's where the presence of God was. Now, we looked at this a couple of weeks ago, and I mentioned that, hey, if you compare the pictures, tabernacle, temple, there are some differences. And the differences are Kind of strange in some respects. We're not going to hit all of them, but you've got two pillars here, Yaquin and Boaz, which you know, if you're familiar with like the Freemasons, man, they make a lot of hay out of that, the two pillars there. But I want to focus on number two, number two and number one. Number two is the bronze sea, and number one is the bronze altar. Now, the altar is just a bigger version of the one in the tabernacle, but you know, you don't have this in the tabernacle, okay? That's because it's going to signify something new, not, not, not new like it's never been thought of before, but in a new way. Anybody can look up 1 Kings 7 real fast. I want, to, I want you to read, whoever can do that, these four verses, just to get a little bit of description in our heads. Again, this is not a devotional passage. <laughs> This is not one of those, I memorized this, you know, in college. <laughs> First Kings 7, 23 through 26. He made the sea of cast bronze. Yep, that's and this. From one room to the other, that's one mark. Yep. It was completely round. Its height was five cubits, and a line of 30 cubits measured its circumference. Below its brim, were ornamental buds encircling it all around, ten to a cubit, all the way around the sea. The ornamental buds were cast in two rows when it was cast. It stood on twelve oxen, three looking toward the north, three looking toward the west, three looking toward the south, three looking toward the east. The sea was set upon them, and all their back parts pointed inward. It was a hand breadth thick. Its brim was shaped like the brim of a cup like a lily blossom. It contained 2,000 baths. Give us another verse or two. He also made 10 carts of bronze. Four cubits was the length of each cart, four cubits its width, three cubits its height. And this was the design of the carts. We had panels, and the panels were between frames. On the panels that were between the frames were lions, oxen, and cherubim. And on the frames was a pedestal on top, Below the lions and the oxen were reeds of plated work. Every cart had four bronze wheels and axles of bronze, and its four feet had supports. Okay. Just, again, just some added detail there. 
what do those things, I mean, just a little, little, little bit of a, we have plant ornaments. We've got, you know, I want to say lions and tigers and bears, but <laughs> we've got the animals there. We've got the cherubim. Anything coming to mind? Okay. It's, again, it's this wilderness, again, the wild, you know, garden of Eden, the cherubim and all that kind of stuff. You've got 12 oxen. You got three, four groups of three. They're all pointing in different directions. You've got these stands that the thing is on with wheels. Okay. Makes you think of Eden. What else would it might make you think of? It's going to come a little bit later. If I say cherubim and wheels, Ezekiel, yeah, okay, just so just hold that thought. Again, it, it's sort of a menagerie. And what's interesting about it, what we want to focus on, we're going to focus on a couple things. It's already in, you know, you, when you go into the temple proper, you're going to have the giant cherubim there. You're going to have, you know, all the, the decorations of the garden and, and again, the wildlife and all this sort of stuff we talked about. This sort of brings some of that outside and you've got a sea. It's called the Sea of Bronze. Now, <clears throat> Myers in her uh, Anchor Bible Dictionary article says this. Just pull out a few excerpts here. It's really big. In fact, the, the, the amount of water in this is a lot more than you would ever need for washing. Okay, even if like you were a pig pen, I mean, it just, it's just, it's huge. She says, just as spectacular as the size of the Sea of Bronze was its ornamentation. Under its rim was a sea, series of cast decorations, two roads of gourds. The rim or the brim itself was made of lily work. Most amazing of all was the way it was supported on four sets of bronze oxen with three oxen in each set. Each faced the direction of the compass. Keep that in mind, the compass. With their hinder parts facing inward, supporting the basin. Now Albright, very famous biblical scholar, uh, who is, he died in 1971 or something like that. Uh, his parents were missionaries. I, I'm a big fan of Albright, even though he sort of gets poo-pooed now because he just believed too much of this stuff. <laughs> uh, taught at Johns Hopkins for many years. I think, I think he's a wonderful guy. But Albright sort of, you know, went off on a tangent here and he thought, well, you know, what about the, the oxen here? And then you have the cherubim. So he, it made him think in one article he wrote, which I don't, I don't quote here, of Ezekiel's cherubim faces. You have 12 elements, 12 cardinal points, 12, you know, with the compass points, the four compass points. It made him think of, of the vision in Ezekiel. And the reason he thought that was because, well, you have to know a little bit about the vision of Ezekiel. Okay, it was not a flying saucer. All right, so let's just get that out of the way. It's also not like an early Leonardo da Vinci plan for an actual flying object. <laughs> what, the, what the 12, or what the cherubim were, this is stock description of a divine throne. I could show you lots of pictures of divine thrones. They are on oxen. The oxen will, you know, will have wings. Uh, they'll have the different faces. Okay, Th this is just, this is what a royal throne looked like. It had wheels, you could move it around, it was portable, all that stuff. Fire, again, the presence of God, Sinai, all these things sort of accumulate in, in Ezekiel. It's not a coincidence that in Ezekiel, the four faces of the cherubim correspond to the four cardinal points of the Babylonian zodiac. Ezekiel's living in Babylon. He's writing to people who are living in Babylon. All of this imagery you can find in Babylon, including the eyes. The eyes in ancient text were references to the stars. Okay, if you had animals with eyes in them, that was a constellation. This is astronomical language. The point of Ezekiel's vision is that Marduk of Babylon was viewed as the ruler of the cosmos. Marduk controls space and time, the passage of time, the epochs of human history. 
And you Jews are sitting here in Babylon by the river Kivar. Why? Because Marduk just kicked Yahweh around. Okay, that, that's Babylonian theology in Ezekiel's day. You're here because your God got beat by our God. And what Ezekiel is saying is he, he lays the whole thing out, the whole worldview out that a Babylonian would understand. And who does he put on the throne? It ain't Marduk. Marduk isn't there. Okay. <laughs> the whole point is that, yep, we're here in Babylon, but the God of Israel is still on the throne. That's the inaugural vision of the prophecy. And then he goes through and he explains, here's why you're here. Boy, you were bad, but you're not going to stay here either. Now you take all of that back. The, the astronomical imagery, in the, the, you know, the pointing to all you know, four points of the compass, telegraphs who is in control of the heavens. Why are the heavens important? Because the heavens are how you measure time. That's how you measure the passage of time. Sun, moon, stars. Who created those things? That would be the God of Israel. Who's in control of those things? If you're in control of those things, you're in control of history. Because those things are linked with time. So if you were reading Ezekiel, the message is very theological. God is still on the throne. He has our destiny in his hand. It looks really bad, and it is but he has our destiny in his hand. When you superimpose that to temple architecture, the message is, this is the center of the cosmos. This is the place from which God controls time and eternity and human history. Uh, there's a couple of other th interesting things about it. In the Bronze Sea, if you just look at the gallons, it's 17,000 gallons, you know, 27 feet. You've got the cubit measurement there, four feet high. Again, this wasn't in the tabernacle. Why? Because this is a, this is a, a picture. If you control the sea, if the sea is calm, if the sea is in the place where God is, Time and eternity and history are well in hand. It's fixed. That's why it's not in the tabernacle, because the tabernacle was mobile. Not only couldn't you get all that water, but how would you move it? Okay, this is a fixed object. When they get in there, they build it. And it's not only that, but even this is a slap in the face to Babylon, Mesopotamian religion. Uh, yeah, Myers continues, in the temple of Marduk, there was an artificial sea. Marduk is the chief god during the, you know, the, the time of the exile. It was called the Ta'amtu, sounds suspiciously like Tiamat, the deep. Okay. Some Babylonian temples had an Apsu sea, a large basin, again, to commemorate this idea. It represented the waters of life at the holy center. Ancient Israel shared this notion of a watery chaos being kept under control by Yahweh. And again, the forces of chaos, the things that would, that would destroy us. The great molten sea near the temple's entrance would have signified Yahweh's power and presence. Now, in Ezekiel 40, I'm going to go back. I want to pick up one. Now, let's do this. There's, one, there's another object here. So this is Again, a symbol of God's control of the forces of chaos. And it's a counterpart to what the Mesopotamians have as well. Now, when it comes to this object, it actually gets called, this is a, a really kind of a strange thing. The altar hearth in Hebrew is Har El. Four cubits from the altar hearth projecting upward, so on and so forth. Har El is the Hebrew equivalent of a Sumerian term, Sumerian, Mesopotamia, Babylon. Okay, they're, they're all using the same languages there. The Aralu. This term in the same passage is to be connected with Akkadian Aralu, a term for the netherworld about which the Chicago Assyrian Dictionary remarks that it was inter alia, a cosmic locality opposite of heaven. 
Although we should note as does Albright that the ancient Israelites may have understood this term as the mountain of God, that's literally what Har El means, the mountain of God, cosmic mountain, sacred space. Where else would you expect that but in the temple? Okay. That's just a page from the Chicago Assyrian Dictionary making the point. The cosmic locality opposite of heaven. Let's think about that. Now, it's the netherworld in Mesopotamia, which is the realm of the dead. In Israel, how would you think about that? Think back to the whole world tree thing. The thing that connects heaven and earth and under the earth. It goes through the altar, which is where you sacrifice. Okay, there's a death metaphor going on there. There's a substitutionary metaphor going on there. You're going to wind up in the netherworld unless you're rightly related to the God of Israel. Okay, there's a salvation metaphor going there. So you have two objects in the temple that talk about God's control over the things that want to kill you. And this notion of to avoid eternal death, we use this altar, again, to be a substitute for you. There's a lot of theology packed in just those two objects. And it's not just sort of operating on an earthly level. It has everything to do with, again, you know, who's in control of, all, of life and death? Who's in control of life and death? and our eternal destiny. Who's in control of all of history? Again, these are big, big thoughts, and they are tied to this place, Jerusalem, this temple, and even within the temple, some of these objects. This is the cosmic center of everything for an Israelite. Now, let's talk about how this relates to how they thought about what happened in the temple. You got stuff going on every day. You've got the bronze sea there. God has all the forces of chaos under control. We've got some of the architecture, the four cardinal points, you know, with the oxen. That's telling us God is in control of the heavens and the earth and the passage of time and history and all this stuff. You got that going on. In the temple. Well, we use the temple. It doesn't just sit there. So we have daily sacrifices. We've got weekly things going on. We've got to do sacrifices at the temple to, you know, commemorate certain times of the year, the festivals. Everything in an Israelite's life really connected in some way to the temple. You kept order in and through the temple so that you could live your, norm, your, your life outside the temple just as a normal Israelite and you could feel safe. You could feel that life wasn't going to just, you know, kill you at any moment. You know, this is where you're protected from the elements of nature. And if you're rightly related to God, you're not committing, again, these, you know, these horrible acts of moral impurity that pollute the land and would cause God to leave. Okay, we spent time on that last week. If you're doing what God asks you to do, everything is going to work. In other words, everything's going to be orderly. You'll have a good life. It won't be a perfect life because you're not perfect, but God's going to stay here. He's going to be with you. You're going to have eternal life. You're not going to, you know, you know, have, you know, end up spending an eternity of divorce from from your God. All of these big theological thoughts. The temple was supposed to remind them of that. And as you went through your year, you would do certain festivals. You know, you to commemorate certain events. You'd have Passover. Okay? You would have the Feast of Tabernacles. Feast of Booths, you know, all these different festivals that commemorated how God had intervened for you in the past. How he had kept you from chaos. How he brought you through the sea. How he created you out of nothing. 
all of these things that would operate on the calendar were supposed to remind you of these episodes as an Israelite. And they all took place at this, this place, you know, the, the temple. Now in the temple, God has a throne. This throne in some passages and namely in Ezekiel 1, but there are a few passages in Kings and Chronicles, it's referred to as the Merkava. Gold star, if anybody knows what Merkava means, the Hebrew term. It means throne chariot. Okay, think of Ezekiel. You got the throne and it's on wheels. It's both. It's dual purpose. <laughs> okay, the thing can move. You know, it, it's, it's a throne chariot. And again, this is when, when we get to Ezekiel, we see the most explicit vision of it. And it's standard where you would portray a, a throne, but it, it takes on importance again conceptually in, in different ways. This is by Rachel Elior. Uh, she's an expert in Merkava uh, stuff in Judaism. In the Holy of Holies, the Devir of Solomon's temple, two gold-plated cherubim shield the cover of the ark with their wings. Their appearance revealed to David as a divine pattern. I mean, God actually says, what you're building here is according to a pattern. It's in the heavens. Okay? It's described in parallel passage in Chronicles, which explicitly links the cherubim with the heavenly chariot throne. In that passage, the, the, the lid of the ark is called the Merkava, this throne. And the Merkava was a representation of the ritual order of cyclic ritual time. In Ezekiel, you got the four faces of the cherubim correspond to the four points of the zodiac. Why? Because it's constellations. We can watch the constellations. They have an annual circuit. It's orderly. It never changes. And Jewish thought went something like this. Well, look at the perfect order of all that. That's pretty fantastic. I mean, the, the heavens, to quote Psalm 19, declare the glory of God. There's like eight different verbs in there for speech and communication in Psalm 19. This is just a fantastic thing. It, it's, it's regular. It, not only doesn't it ever change, but like who could change it? You know, you know the, the God made this and God's in control of it. And they thought, well, you, you know, how does, that, how does that work? I wonder what would happen if we start like keeping a calendar and counting days between events. And why would God tell us like, hey, you know, you, you work six days and on the seventh you rest. And what's this business with seven? Why do, you know, why do we have multiple sevens? You know, why, you know, all these questions, and you've asked them if you've read this stuff, you know, what, what's up with the numbers? Well, it turns out <laughs> the Merkava was a visual representation because it mapped time of the ritual order of cyclic time measured in Sabbaths of days. These are called weeks. If you've ever done the 70 weeks of Daniel, you know, story, weeks and days, weeks, days, and years, you can use the terminology for all of them. The fourfold annual seasons in turn subdivided in accordance with a fixed sevenfold order. Similarly, the concept of sacred time derived from the seven days of creation. Accordingly, there are seven days in a week counted in Sabbaths of days, seven days of performance performed by each priestly course, serving in the temple, seven days of consecration, seven week intervals between harvests. If you took the whole ritual calendar and divide it by, you can actually divide it by four. It, it's evenly divisible. In this calendar, let's see here if I have the one up here. Yeah, let's go with this one. The priests, the priesthood that came out of the Old Testament exilic period, again, think of Ezekiel. Ezekiel is when they start the exile and they're developing, you know, Ezekiel's writing about all this stuff. They came up with a calendar that works with perfect mathematical symmetry and, and it corresponds to all these biblical numbers. It's kind of a marvel. Now it's a mathematical calendar. It's not an astronomical calendar. They believed it began on day four of creation. Why day four? What's created on day four? The timekeepers, the sun, 
the moon, and the stars. So that, that's the first day of, of God's calendar. So they begin on the fourth day, and all of the numerically significant events, if you keep what's called a 364-day calendar with all these divisible by seven, you know, 49, all these numbers, if you keep that calendar, every feast day, every Sabbath, every Passover falls on the same day every year. It never varies. It is perfectly mathematically precise. It requires no adjustment. And all the numbers, again, correspond to these numbers that you see in the Bible a lot, these multiples. Now, they believed that it was so perfect that it has to reflect the mind of God. God set this up. It's in time, in tune with the heavens. It never alters. It never needs adjustment. If we follow it, we can be sure that we are never out of sync. What's going on in earth on the temple, in the temple, is never out of sync with what's happening in heaven. As in heaven, so on earth. They had a whole developed theology of what we do here is not only a mirror of what God is doing, it not only is what God wants us to do, but he commanded us. But if we don't do it, then chaos erupts. This is why when you have very liturgical religions, okay, Judaism, you know, especially in, in ancient Judaism, some of this works, you know, into questions in Christianity about, have you ever wondered like why they fought so much over when to have Easter? This is a debate that went for centuries. They like fought wars over when we date Easter. This is why. Because we got to get it right to be in sync with God. We must get it right. Now, the reason they had the problem is because the Pharisees did not use this calendar. <laughs> they used the lunar calendar, which requires them to add a month every now and then to make everything realign. And if you were among the people who the Qumran is where, they, where the Dead Sea Scrolls are associated with, this is why they left the Pharisee, the Pharisaic priesthood just before Jesus' day and during Jesus' day. They left and went out in the desert to keep this calendar in a temple that they didn't have. They didn't have access to it because the temple's back in Jerusalem. So they actually like have these long texts where they imagine themselves doing this stuff so that God would know, hey, somebody's tracking with this. I mean, it, it just sounds in, incredibly crazy and bizarre, but they thought they're the only, we're the only guys between, you know, life on earth and complete annihilation because of this calendar stuff. Again, to, to our ear, this is like, this is like Looney Tunes. But again, they thought, why Pharisees, why are you refusing to map time according to the way God told you to map it? He laid it all out and they had a big fight over it. That's actually why they left. And to our ear, that's just crazy stuff. Now, I'll just give you one thing. If you take their calendar and you map out Jubilee cycles, again, it, you, you can do it. You, you just need a computer. Nowadays, it's just a computer program or you've got to be really good at math. <clears throat> they expected Messiah's appearance to be sometime between 3 BC and 2 AD. That's a freebie for those of you who have seen my lecture on the birth of the Messiah, because they're the only ones in antiquity that actually plotted it out correctly. They had the right window. Everybody else didn't. Okay, it's just, to me, that's just really kind of interesting that they, there's a big question in academia, were the priests at Qumran when Jesus showed up, did they all convert? Because it's like, okay, we were expecting that. And, and, you know, academics like to fight about that stuff because there are similarities between their theology and the New Testament. There are th things that, that carry over. But they, they, actually, they actually got it right. Uh, you know, you can't get it 
if you follow the Pharisees' calendar, and here's, here's uh, you know, just the one last thing. If you use the calendar followed by the Pharisees, the lunar one, where you have to add months every now and then, the birth date of Jesus wouldn't have fallen in the same period. It wouldn't have been a jubilee year. But, but if you use the biblical chronology, Jesus began his ministry in a jubilee year. And why is that significant? Luke 4, 14 through 19. The day Jesus begins his ministry, he walks into the synagogue at Nazareth and says what? What does he quote? He quotes the Jubilee passage. He quotes Isaiah 61 and mixes in a little bit of the Leviticus stuff. So that this is the year that the captives are set free. You know, all the, you know, he quotes the passage and he says, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I mean, I actually think he meant that. <laughs> like he knew what was going on. Uh, but, but again, this is, this is just sort of really, it's bizarre. It's a little bit crazy. But the people who are living in the first century who are tracking things like calendar and chronology and Messiah. And by the way, they're not too crazy because doesn't any, you know, we have people who do that today. I'm not one of them. I'm not a prophecy geek. Okay. This I find interesting, but I'm not doing the blood moon thing and all that kind of stuff. But they were doing it in the ancient world and they were using a very specific method to do it. And it was based on the role of the temple in sacred space, certain objects in the temple and what they symbolized. That, that's how they, that was their system. And it has these weird synchronicities <laughs> with what you actually see in the New Testament. Now, last slide. If you go to Ezekiel 40 through 48, which is a passage about what? The temple, the idealized temple. There are 60 references to Jubilee numbers and their multiples. Not six, 60. That's a lot. And again, people who are into calendar and chronology have noticed that. Why are all these numbers either a jubilee or half a jubilee or a seven or something like this? Why do they sync up with this view of the calendar? Again, if you're able to think about this beyond just sort of a, a literal correspondence, oh, it's about building going to construct a building. Well, it'd be nice if they put a, put a roof, instructions for a roof in there. The, the temple in Ezekiel 40 to 48 does not have a roof. Okay. <laughs> it lacks certain other things that you would expect in the temple based upon the temple of Solomon. And they're, they're not in there either. So, so it just, again, it just makes me wonder that this, I'm, I'm interested in this subject. Boy, that's a lot. That's a lot of things, that's a lot of ways to, when people are reading about a temple, it's a lot of ways to make people think about Jubilee, release of the captives, setting the captives free, redeeming the land. Again, all these concepts that go with Jubilee. And if you look at how the New Testament talks about the temple, who does it talk about? I just gave it away. Jesus. Jesus is the temple. He refers to himself as the temple. And he refers to you as the temple because you are members of his body. Again, is all of that a coincidence? See, I, I don't think it is a coincidence. I think it marks a really, really intelligent, frankly, divine mind. They, they knew what they were trying to telegraph, and it actually worked in real time, which I think is kind of remarkable. So the purpose of tonight was, again, to do a little crazy stuff. But some of the crazy stuff, again, what I want you to, to, to encourage you to do is when you're reading through Scripture, assume that none of it is throwaway material. <laughs> Okay, there, there may be a reason why it has this set of instructions 
this set of numbers, it might just mean more than, especially if it has to do with, with ritual and sacred objects and something God is doing. Okay, there might be something more behind it. And then always check in the New Testament to see what they do with it. They do really unusual things with certain passages that wouldn't occur to you, but seemed intuitive to them, or they would turn around and say, well, you know, when we were, when we were over here, we remembered what Jesus said to us, and it didn't make any sense when he said it, but now it makes like kind of sense. And they'll, they'll, they'll run with it. It's, hind, it's hindsight. We, we have the benefit of lots of hindsight. We have 2,000 years of hindsight. Okay, they, had, they had hindsight and they could look back and, and things just sort of, pieces you know, fell into place. That's what I'm trying to encourage you to do. I don't expect anybody to remember this or really necessarily even you know, care to go back and go through it. The lesson for tonight is read carefully and don't assume anything's there by accident. <laughs> Because it may not be. It may not be. They may think about it quite differently. Yes. Yes. It, it's all, it could all be more profitable than, than you can even imagine. You know? And again, that, that, to me, that, that's, entertaining is not the right word, but it's, it's what, it's just kind of neat. Okay, I mean, that, that's kind of a dumb word. But it's just kind of neat that there could be so much packed into the description of an object. Well, who cares about, you know, the, okay, the altar is bigger. Big deal. You called it har L. whoop de doo Well, it's the mountain of God. That's why it's a big deal. And the Babylonians have one too, but ours is better. You know, we're, we're, we're basically, you know, poking them in the eye. There, there are just things like that lurking in the background of a lot of passages. And it, it, you know, it takes work to ferret some of that stuff out. But that's why they call it Bible study. <laughs> you know, Bible study is not Bible reading. Spend a little time on it, noodle it a little bit. And you know, you'll find some really interesting things. Just trajectories you can just run on. And, and I like it. It just makes me appreciate Again, the, the, it makes me appreciate scripture uh, as something more than a, it's more than Shakespeare, okay? Um, it, there's, there's just an intelligence behind it. I'm not trying to dish Shakespeare, <laughs> anybody's a Shakespeare fan. Uh, but there's just an intelligence behind it that you won't find in anything else. So anybody have any, any questions? Any, now that we're into crazy time, crazy talk, but. Go ahead. Just so I'm clear on, because I like, lost it just for a second. When you're talking about the throne and chariot, is that the bronze seat? No. Are they the same thing? So the, something different? There, there are images that are common to both. Okay. okay. So you're not saying those are equal things? No. There's, there, there are points of both that telegraph the same ideas. You know, one is order, you know, holding chaos in order. The other one is, again, time and history and the cosmos. Well, what was the bronze sea used for? That's a really good question because we're not actually ever really told. <laughs> you know, the, the scholars assume, well, it's water. What do you do with water? You wash. You know, it, there's no passage that ever has them washing in it. They're never directed, you know. It, it was just kind of there. It's supposed to mean something. So, so why, again, why, why bronze? Why bronze sea?
Yeah, I, I think when they lose the temple, by definition, you know, you're going to lose most of that. Now, you could go back. You could, you could observe Passover, technically. See that the regulations for Passover in Exodus 12 are actually a little different than they are in Deuteronomy. For instance, in Exodus 12, you're allowed to hold Passover in your house. You're not allowed to do that in Deuteronomy. There, there are other differences, but that's the most obvious. And Deuteronomy presumes that they're in the land and then it becomes a central ceremony for the nation, like collectively. But before that, you could do it in your house. So this is what, it's, it's an illustration of the kind of thing that Jews did. We don't have a temple anymore. We wanna keep Passover. So we're basically gonna do the best we can here. You know, we're going to keep the Passover, we're going to hold it in the house with family and all that kind of stuff. So you could still do things like that. But as far as the sacrificial system, until they build the second temple, you know, which is modified then by Herod, second temple is roughly 516 BC, all the way into the second century. Um, and presuming they're allowed to, to do it, uh, they could they could do it, but there was a period in between there that they just they didn't have any of that. That's when you get the synagogue develop when they're in exile. All they can do is teach. They can teach scripture. They can do Passover in their house. They can try to keep you know some of the laws that I mean you're still going to have priests. You're not going to really have the regular courses because there's really no point to that because we don't have a temple. But you can do some of those things and keep the. Uh, keep the system alive in uh, as many ways as you can, you know, without that. Which is what they do today. It's kind of, yeah, it, if you're really orthodox, yeah, you do the best you can without that, but, but that's why they push. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, for, for the ultra-orthodox, this is why the rebuilding a temple is a crucial thing, you know, to restore everything. Um, but they, they do the best they can. PETA didn't have to end it. <laughs> no. No, this is pre PETA. <laughs> uh, anybody else? All right. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Uh,